today on the Become a Unique Podcast, I have such a beautiful guest by the name of Dinah. Welcome. Hi, Unique. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. And thank you so much for being here. I can't wait for us to be in conversation because there's so much I want to learn. <laughs> <laughs> but before we get started, you got to let everybody know who is Dinah. Huh. Dinah, myself, I am an American Lithuanian, a former civil engineer, current nutrition therapist master, helping women fix their guts and improve their skin health. Yes, you know, it, I think that's every woman's goal to heal the guts and make sure they have beautiful skin. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> but before we start talking about healing the gut, can you please let us know what are you grateful for today? Whew, well, Today is Valentine's Day while we're recording this. So I'm very grateful for my fiance. He's my rock and my best friend. And um, I'm grateful for the path that I found of my own health journey and being able to help others. So it's been very rewarding and I am grateful for it every day. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Um, I love it. I love that we was able to take a moment for gratitude. So um, before we start talking about the gut, tell us about your health journey. Yes. So as I mentioned, I'm a former civil engineer. So I was working as a civil engineer and thought I was taking care of myself, my, myself and my health. I was eating well. I was exercising, doing all the things. I thought I was pretty holistic, but I was never feeling right. My energy was tanked. I would be the one, I couldn't go to the movie theaters. Like I would literally fall asleep. No matter what time of day we went, I would fall asleep because my energy was so low. Mm. I had adult acne that seems to be getting worse. Usually when you're a teenager, your acne is kind of bad and then you grow out of it. Mine was getting worse and worse as I was getting into my twenties and overall hormonal imbalances. I had lost my cycle for five or six months. So all these things were happening and I didn't know what the problem was. So I started researching and finding an interest in food and thought, well, maybe if I change my diet, things might improve. At the time I decided to go vegan, thinking that that would be a great thing for my body. And my skin did temporarily improve, but then it got worse and my fatigue got worse and all other things started to happen. While I was experimenting with diet, I started realizing that I'm really interested in nutrition and civil engineering was not my passion. I did not want to do that. And instead I loved the idea of working on people's health and helping them improve their health. So I found a school and studied nutrition therapy. So I became a certified nutrition therapist master. Through everything I learned in my own education, I was finally able to figure out what the heck was going on in my gut, with my skin. Didn't think that I had horrible digestive issues until I started learning more about it and then realized, oh, this isn't normal. It's not normal to be constipated and not go to the bathroom for two or three days. Mm -hmm. And it's not normal to get bloated and gassy after eating almost every single meal. I just thought it was normal and it's definitely not. So through everything that I learned, I was able to run testing on myself, change my diet, use supplements to really heal myself from within. And that ended up healing my skin. So my adult acne went away. And that's what I love helping other women with. Mm, beautiful. You know, um, I, I say this on a lot of my episodes, one of my guests said that she's a wounded warrior. And you know, that's how she, you know, kind of pushed her into her healing journey. So, you know, it sounds and it's kind of like, over and over and over, the best healers have been the ones that's been wounded. You understand what it's like to not have your gut health and, you know, top shape. So you had to go on your own to seek like what's going on. And once you discover like, oh, okay, this isn't normal. Let me go out here and let everyone else know <laughs> the keys to the success that I found the, out about the gut. So, um, you know, so, you know, I'm a true believer, you know, um, life is happening, you know, for you, not to you. So, mm -hmm. you know, you, by you having those issues, you know, it brought you to this place so you can now become a healer in the space of helping others, you know, say, hey, am I constipated? Hey, is my gut out of whack? So thank you for being a wounded warrior. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so well said. I love that wounded warrior. I'll have to yeah. use that. So you, okay. So you was like, okay, you found out your gut was out of whack, but let's start from, I like to go ABCs. What is gut health? Mm -hmm. So many of us have heard about the microbiome. So when we think about the microbiome, typically people refer to the gut microbiome, even though we have a microbiome everywhere. So gut health is the health of that gut microbiome, all the bacteria, viruses, yeast that live in the gut and making sure that they're all balanced because the gut is so important for the rest of the body. People don't really think about it. They think, oh, my gut health is out of whack only if I have digestive issues. Not true at all. 
So you can have zero digestive issues, but your gut health might not be as healthy as it should be. So one main thing that happens to us in modern day is just that our gut microbiome bacteria aren't as strong or diverse. When you look at these other cultures who live in very traditional ways, so like tribal type of cultures, their gut microbiome is crazy diverse. It's completely different from us in the Western world because of all the things we're exposed to. And, you know, it's hard to we, it's hard to avoid certain things, whether it's certain toxicities, whether it's on our food or in our air and our water, antibiotic use, which is so important to help us to make sure that we live longer lives and don't and can fight diseases, but also that really disrupts our gut microbiome. So everything is impacted from the health of the gut, skin, thyroid health, bone health, brain health, because there's so many bi-directional relationships. Mm -hmm. One thing I like to tell people as an example is we're all pretty aware of the gut brain connection because like when you're nervous, uh, you get like butterflies in your stomach or maybe mm -hmm. get like nauseous or how, you know, mm -hmm. an unexpected bowel movement of something is happening. That's, you know, yep. anxiety inducing. <laughs> so we understand that's like, Oh, why? That's so strange. Why does the gut impact or the brain impact the gut? But it happens the other way as well. The gut can impact the brain. So things mm -hmm. like anxiety or depression or ADHD, that there's a lot of research to show that there is a relationship from or your gut maybe being out of balance and causing those kind of brain issues. And the list just goes on. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for um, bringing up so many points about that as well, too. And at the end, closing off that, you know, just as we feel it in our gut when something's going off and, you know, the physical life, then it's also the same way. Like it can reverse itself as well, too. If the gut is not doing well, it can go up to the top and then it's creating all of these other issues for us. So to realize that the gut is important, it's very yeah. important. <laughs> so, um, so I feel like I feel like I had a question on the um the tip of my tongue, but I just wanted to ask you more on the holistic end of things. Like, how do you feel about like because you each each one of us is different. So I can be in the household of you know my family household and we're eating the same exact meal, but all of us are reacting differently to the meal, to the same meal. And it's like, how is this happening? Because we're all in the same household, we're all in the same in the environment, but things are happening different within each, you know, each and every one of us. So, um, you know, how, or what do you feel about towards like holistic, holistically, like Ayurvedic or eating for your blood type? Like, do you incorporate any of that into your, you know, your programming or, mm -hmm. you know, like we're thinking about like, wait a minute, we have different blood types. So our meal plants should look different. Can you talk on that for a little bit? Oh, that's such a good question. I try to incorporate parts of every type of modality as much as I see is evidence-based and helpful for my clients, but you're spot on of we're all bio-individual. So it's not like an Ayurvedic approach is good for everyone or whatever it might be, or this kind of diet is the perfect diet. And I know the secret now and everyone should eat this mm -hmm. way. It, it doesn't work that way. Everyone is so different. So any nutrition advice that you follow, really, you got to tweak it to what works for you. Um, I would say that I don't really have a specific modality that I follow. I follow more of a whole foods, nutrient dense type of diet. And it's as simple as that. I mean, some might qualify it as leaning paleo. So, but that really depends on the person. So a paleo diet might be something where you don't eat dairy or grains, not to say that nobody can eat that, but that's often a diet foundation that works for a lot of people in the beginning. So when we work on gut healing, a paleo type of, pro, of, of approach is typically a diet that works for most people. And then we tweak it as needed. If someone resonates with Ayurvedic principles, and that's something that they really like, think about like hot and cold foods and eating with the seasons and things like that, then that's a great approach for them. But typically, I stick to really basic foundational paleo type diets, and then go from there. Okay, so um, thank you for that. So what's a sign of an unhealthy gut? So like we're here sitting here and like you said, you just thought everything you were experiencing was normal because that's all you knew. So what are signs of an unhealthy gut that we may have to say, hey, this ain't right? Mm -hmm. So digestive issues are number one, whether that's constipation. And I would consider constipation not having a daily bowel movement. So some resources may say that as long as you're going every two to three days, it's fine. I would disagree. I think every single day, at least once, one to three times a day really would be ideal. That's what you're looking for. You're looking for healthy bowel movements. 
So making sure they're not too on the wet side, no, not too runny, not too constipated and hard. So healthy bowel movements, feeling good after eating. So once in a while, having some gas is okay, especially if you're eating really high fiber foods. But it's something that, that if it's something that's happening after every single meal, your gas clears the room type of thing. You get really <laughs> bloated. Like yeah. um, like where people say, oh, I look like I'm six months pregnant or something like that. Like yeah. that, that's not normal. A little bit of bloating is okay. That's okay. There's food in your stomach. It's getting digested. The problem becomes when it becomes distended and and painful is the worst sign. So mm -hmm. those are more digestive symptoms. Then we also get related digestive symptoms, which are things like heartburn and acid reflux. So if you're someone who keeps the Pepto-Bismol or Tums in their purse and is always relying on it, that's a big red flag. There's something going on in your, in your gut. You shouldn't be having any type of heartburn or acid reflux. Even after foods that are like more acidic, again, it's probably a sign that your gut is having a hard time digesting them and there's something up. Then, mm -hmm. other than digestive issues, because the gut is so important for the rest of the body, they can be systemic symptoms that you would never expect. I mean, acne is a great example. Mm -hmm. I had no idea that my acne had anything to do with my gut. I thought it was a topical problem. There was something wrong with my skin itself, and I had to put creams on it and fix it somehow from the outside. I fixed my gut, and my skin magically cleared without any changes and topicals, anything like that. Washing my pillowcase more, any of that junk. Really, it's it's all about the gut. Then, brain health we talked about focus, brain fog, those could be symptoms of an unhealthy gut, very much related, could be hormonal imbalances. Part of the gut's job is to clear hormones. So very common hormonal imbalances, if women are, if women are getting PMS, cramps, heavy cycles, that's often a sign of high estrogen, or at least an um, unbalanced estrogen and estrogen dominance. And the gut's really important for clearing estrogen. So even though it appears as a hormonal imbalance that, oh, my, my hormones aren't going to whack, really, it's probably your gut not being able to clear your hormones effectively and your detox pathways are clogged up. Mm. I mean, the list goes on and on and how many things could be wrong to signify gut health. But if you feel like you're eating a pretty good diet, your lifestyle is pretty good, and some kind of symptoms are lingering, gut health is a good place to look. Yeah, you know, because that was going to be my next question, because someone may be eating, you know, um, pretty whole, pretty much all whole foods. And it's like, why am I still bloated? Why am I still, you know, dealing with issues of constipation? You know, I'm cut away all the processed stuff. Like, so, you know, what's happening there? Like with that person, like, it's like, I'm eating whole foods, like what's going on? Mm -hmm. So in that case, there's very likely a gut imbalance because if you have, even if you have the perfect diet, if there's something out of balance in your gut, first of all, you're probably not absorbing the nutrients, which is such a waste if you're eating this beautiful, organic, colorful diet, and it's not even able to get absorbed into your body because your gut isn't strong enough. So in that case, it could be your enzyme production or your hydrochloric acid production, both of which are really important for absorbing the nutrients from your food. When your gut health is off, those can get really low. So you're just not able to literally break down the food that you're eating. So that could be one aspect of it. Another could be if your diet isn't varied enough, or if you had to go through a round of antibiotics, or if you're exposed to toxicity in your environment, that can really disrupt the gut microbiome. So that's where you want, your gut microbiome is kind of like a garden. So you want all the flowers to be blooming and really strong. And, you know, a little bit of weeds are okay, but as long as they're, you know, weak and the flowers are strong, you'll be fine. That's what your gut wants to look like. What happens is the flowers end up dying off. So that's the good bacteria and the weeds, the bad bacteria, the parasites, the yeast mm -hmm. take over and they take over your garden and it's not pretty. That's when the symptoms could definitely start. So really important to focus on that good, healthy microbiome to make sure that you're eating a lot of diversity of foods, healthy foods, whole foods, avoiding any type of inflammatory foods. And then the last thing that could be wrong could be some kind of imbalance and, or overgrowth. So maybe it's some kind of parasite infection, which can happen in the Western world. People think that, oh, I, I've never traveled. I'm fine. Not at all true. I mean, raw fish at the grocery store, mm -hmm. you might have parasites. So you never know. So it's very common to have parasite infections. It could be some kind of yeast overgrowth, especially if you're having like uh, sugar cravings, or you have like some like fungal issues and you, or yeast infections, and you get, just get these yeasty issues that could be stemming from the gut. So lots of things could be happening uh, that could be even a healthy diet won't necessarily be able to balance out because those imbalances are so deep that you need a little bit of a stronger push with something like supplements. Okay. So it's, so this is really good to hear because it's like, well, I'm eating good. I'm eating the way they say I'm supposed to eat, but you know, you could still be not absorbing. So then it's like, 
that sucks. Like you, like you said yeah. at the beginning, it's like, oh wait, you're eating this beautiful diet, but it's not even doing what it needs to do within you because your system needs to be, I guess, adjusted. Exactly. Yep. And the other thing is food sensitivities and you can get food sensitivities to healthy foods. Mm -hmm. So it could be something like avocado or broccoli, and you have no idea that you're sensitive to it, but because your gut lining has been disrupted, your body sees those foods as inflammatory now. So every time you eat avocado, which you think, oh my gosh, this is so great for me. I'm getting all the healthy fats and fiber yeah. and you feel like crap after it could be that you're sensitive to avocado and you need to heal your gut so that you can get rid of those food sensitivities. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, like where so someone may say, well, I've been eating pretty well my whole life. Like, where is this coming from? You know, where is it coming from? Like, where are all these sensitivities and gut issues coming from? Um, that's that's happening. People may be questioning. Yeah. So the great question. One could be about a food poisoning. And it could have been like something severe, like a couple of days you were out, or it could have been something like salmonella, some kind of severe food poisoning, or not even. It could just be you had a round of diarrhea, and that just disrupted your delicate gut microbiome. And ever and after that, until you work on rebalancing it, you're going to have gut issues. Mm -hmm. Another could be in a bout of antibiotics. So let's say you had to take antibiotics for something that was really helpful and beneficial, and it worked to clear whatever infection you might have had. But mm -hmm. that's what antibiotics do. They're antibacteria. They kill bacteria, the bad guys and the good guys. Mm -hmm. So what they don't kill is things like yeast, for example. So what commonly happens, and women know this a lot, they know inherently that after antibiotics, we often get yeast infections. Mm -hmm. And that's often because the bacteria was all killed off and the antibiotics don't kill the yeast. And then the yeast wants to have to party because now they have all this room to grow and then they overgrow. So mm -hmm. just one round of antibiotics can really disrupt the gut microbiome. And then other than that, there's so many different factors in our environment. So pesticides on food, really pesticides are, they're, they're almost like an antibacterial. So they're killing off the mi microbiota when we eat them. So if you're eating a lot of not organic foods, you could be getting some pesticide um, toxicity, could be heavy metals in the environment, could be over cleaning. So using too many sanitizers, all of this is disrupting your gut microbiome. So it could be affecting wow. you to the point where your gut just gets out of balance. Wow. Like that's, that's like crazy. It's like, you're trying to, you know, be on top of your game, you're cleaning and you're sanitizing it, but yet they all have chemicals and it's disrupting, you know, our gut. And, you know, also you said something like you're eating a healthy diet, but yet they have all these chemicals on them, the pesticides, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So what advice do you give for like, you know, the pesticides. Do you have any advice towards that? Because it's like, I want to eat whole foods, but now some, this could be someone's reason. Well, they got too much chemicals on them. What's, mm -hmm. what, what do you suggest for the pesticides? Oof, so organic when possible, when available, when affordable, that would be my best suggestion because organic foods are minimally spirited pesticides and they are organically approved pesticides. So they're just completely different than what would be a conventional food. If budget is an issue or availability is an issue, focusing on the foods where you eat the whole thing to be organic. So for example, lettuce. So lettuce, you're eating the whole thing or a berry or something with skin like apples. So because you're eating the whole thing, it's better to have it organic. Whereas other things that you're peeling like onion, avocado, banana. So you're actually peeling off the outside layer. That's mm -hmm. less important to buy organic. So if you had to choose a hierarchy and what do I want to buy organic, the things that you're almost like not able to peel off the layer off of. That's what you want to focus on organic for vegetables and produce. Mm, okay. Do you have any suggestions with cleaning? Um, cleaning products? Yeah, with cleaning. Because I use um, baking soda. I didn't know if you had any suggestions ah, to, um, yeah. with, for the pesticides. Yes, I think it helps to some degree. It's not going to completely take everything off. I think it doesn't hurt to clean things off. I personally, because I buy most things organic, I just kind of rinse it off with water. But I think it does definitely doesn't hurt to do baking soda or some kind of special uh, like vinegar cleaners or things like that. Okay. Okay. So yeah. So, you know, I'm happy that we make a pause for that because it brings awareness to this because it's like I said, you could be eating this beautiful, you know, plant-based diet. And then, you know, you are constantly disrupting the microbiome because of the chemicals that the government, that they're spraying on our food. Yeah. <laughs> so you, right. Yeah. So um, to be mindful of that, to be mindful when you can get organic, to get organic and which type of 
fruits and vegetables or produce that you would think about getting organic versus when you'll say, I'll save the dollar and get non-organic, you know, and then also, you know, being mindful about washing with like baking soda, I know is definitely helps greatly towards the, um, towards the pesticides and the chemicals that are being sprayed on. So, uh, yeah, so I'm happy that we brought that, brought that to the table. Okay, so now it sounds like many of us probably listening here have some type of gut issue. I, I feel like in this society, it's very hard not to have a gut issue with everything that we have going on, even with eating the best diet. We're still eating <laughs> eating things. And I think every one of us have had a dose of antibiotics throughout our life. And we still may be suffering from that, you know, taking a dosage years ago and with our gut is still never rebalanced. So it's still trying to heal from that. So um, what's next? What do we do? We say, okay, we got gut issues. How do you figure out what type of gut issues? Because mine's may be different from yours. Mm -hmm. Well, I love testing. And that is something that's completely elevated my practice doing functional testing. So testing food sensitivities and testing stools. So GI map stool testing is what I use in my practice to see what's actually happening because we can throw spaghetti at the wall. We can try a bunch of stuff. We can shoot in the dark, trying to figure out what's happening. But for example, I might not, never know you have a parasite because it's symptoms really overlap. So you could have be having these symptoms like digestive issues, but that could be happening from a parasite or a yeast overgrowth or a bacterial imbalance. And really, we want to give you the best diet and the best supplement protocol and lifestyle changes to make sure that we're actually addressing whatever's causing those issues. So I really love doing testing so we can test, not guess, just get to the root cause of it faster so that we're not wasting your time and making sure that we can get better as fast as possible. Okay. And so with stool testing, um, now, sometimes, you know, let's say you had like some crappy food and you, <laughs> you, you know, you was eating pizza and junk and then your stomach is jacked up and your stool is jacked up with, with what you just ate and you decide to do the stool test. Will it make a difference? Or someone says, oh, I'm about to do that stool test. Let me go eat some salads for the next two days. Does it make a difference on what you ate prior days to tell this long history of what's been going on in your gut? That's such a good question. It is to some degree, yes, it will make a difference, but rebalancing the gut won't happen in a couple of days, positively or negatively. One pizza isn't going to destroy our gut microbiome, but one salad isn't going to make it magically fabulous. So somewhat it will change the test results. So anytime I do test people, I tell them, you know, follow the same usual diet you usually do. Don't try to do anything crazy because we want to see what's going on in there. And it is a snapshot in time. So no test is going to be perfect. So I'd like to tell people we're always taking it with a grain of salt. And the most important things that we're looking at are the patterns. So generally, are you kind of leaning low towards the healthy gut microbiota? So are you kind of lacking high, strong diversity? That's sort of one pattern. Do we have a pattern of low stomach acid? Are there a couple of things that are popping up that show, huh, your digestive capacity isn't as strong as it should be. We really want to work on that. We want to maybe supplement with, with stomach acid. We want to work on chewing your food and being relaxed at meals to make sure that your body really gets into that sympathetic rest or the parasympathetic rested state to make sure you can actually digest the food. So that's the most important thing that I'm looking for in a stool test is what patterns have I seen to show what those issues might be that you're struggling with. So you can get all of this from this from one stool setting? setting? It's crazy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What they're able to show everything from gut bacteria, parasites, yeast. Uh, so your inflammation mm -hmm. in the gut, how you're reacting to gluten, which a lot of people want to know, which is mm -hmm. wheat. So yeah, yeah, it's amazing what the test can show. Now you said food sensitivity. Is that also within the stool or is that a different test? That's a separate test. So that's a blood test that we take. And that is showing how something called mediators are released when you eat food. So it basically shows the inflammation that your body experiences when it eats certain foods. And it tests about almost 200 foods, everything from healthy foods to less healthy foods, like more like chemicals that are added to foods, just to see where you are on that spectrum. So that's a really good one right to see. For example, the avocado example, like how do they react to avocado? Are there certain healthy foods that they think every day they have their broccoli or their eggs or whatever it might be? Maybe that's a food that's causing inflammation every single time they eat it. 
So while we're doing a gut healing protocol, we take out those foods temporarily. I like to think of it as if you had a, like a knee scrape, you scraped your knee and it was all kind of bloody, but every single day you kept falling on that knee and scraping it over and over again. That's kind of what's happening to your gut when you're eating a food that's inflammatory. Your gut just can't heal because you're just mm. adding that inflammation yeah. over, and over again. So that's why while we're doing a gut healing protocol with a diet, a supplements, a protocol, we really want to take out those foods that were causing inflammation just temporarily. And my goal is to get my clients to eat as much variety as possible. So you're not restricted to you know, 30 foods or something like that. I want people to eat tons of different types of vegetables, proteins, all that, and feel good doing it. Wow. So when you do the food sensitivity test, it literally comes back avocado, like, you know, it, it lists all of them, apples, oranges, and they say like a spectrum, let's, is it like, let's say one to 10. And then where you land on the spectrum of like how much your body is able to digest it well without inflammation to, you know, how difficult it is for your body to, you, um, so it includes meats and dairies mm -hmm. and, um, all, okay. All yeah, of that. Okay. Exactly. Oh, I feel like all of us need that test. I feel like <laughs> It's like, it's so interesting how we have to go to functional medicine to find these tests when this should be something the doctors should be giving us. Right? Wouldn't you, you think? Know, I feel yeah. like it should be a, stan a, a standard instead of them just giving you a, a pill to say, oh, I'm having a stomach ache. Here goes a pill. Let's find, let's get to the root cause of it. Totally. Um, totally. Okay. Wow. That, that's amazing. So, um, so from blood and stool, you're able to like do this. So let's say, okay, the food sensitivity, let's say, let's keep the avocado going. <laughs> let's say we we're sensitive to avocado now and we remove it from the diet. Once we start to heal the gut, we start to introduce it back in and then we test again to see what the sensitivity is. So I end up not usually retesting the food sensitivities just because we're going to look for reactions. So yeah. I typically have people th avoid that sensitive food for three to six months, depending on how severe that sensitivity was, where they are on that spectrum. After those three months, let's say avocado was on their, on their three month elimination. That's the only thing they change in their diet. And that's very important. You don't want to be eating a avocado salad that has tomatoes and bell peppers and spinach and all of those things were on your sensitivity list. You want to just yeah. reintroduce avocados, see how you feel for a couple of days. So usually I wait about three days. And if you eat avocados and you feel totally fine, I consider that a green food. You've got the green light. You can eat it again in your diet. So your gut has likely been able to heal. Your body doesn't see it as an inflammation inducer anymore. And that's good to go. Yeah. Okay. And now uh, I know inf now when you say inflammation, um, inflammation is maybe is getting bloated. Is it gassy? Um, now also like, I feel like sometimes I will, if I eat something, I may get crampy feeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is, is that inflammation? Definitely. And inflammation can be so many other things outside the digestive tract. It could be a headache. So sometimes people will get a headache after eating. So if that's you, start paying attention. Like is every time you eat, I don't know, strawberries, do you get a headache? Maybe that's a food you're sensitive to. It could be fatigue. So getting really tired after a meal. It could be joint pain. It could be like kind of post-nasal drip or any type of, type of phlegmy. Yeah. Stuff. yeah. So it could be so many different things. And so usually when people reintroduce foods back into their diet, I give them a long list of these are the symptoms to look out for. So if you find any of these are happening recur recurrently after reintroducing that food, that's probably a food that you want to avoid for a little bit longer and maybe do a little bit more gut healing. Mm, okay. Okay. So, so this is so amazing to do, to hear. Do you ever do retesting like after a certain amount of months just to see where someone is compared to where they were before? Yeah. I mean, usually I do that for stool testing. If there's still lingering symptoms, some okay. people will feel amazing. They're like 95% perfect after a three month protocol. And so at that point, there's no reason to, I mean, we've probably gotten to them to a place where they feel really good. No reason spending money on another test, but if there's still lingering symptoms, especially if there were specific things they were working on, like for example, acne, and it's clearly better, but still not totally gone. We're peeling the layers of the onion. So we did one gut protocol. We probably tackled a lot of things that were out of balance, but it's not an overnight process. It's not a pill that you can pop and you feel better the next day. This healing takes a long time. I mean, it took the person a long time to get to the place where they are. Yeah. So it's going to take a long time to heal back so that your body can actually balance. So that's hard to hear for some people because we still want to get better faster. Yeah. But once you actually do the healing work and get to the root cause, you're golden. And then as long as you follow a healthy lifestyle, you'll very likely feel good for decades. 
Yeah, I was going to ask. I was like, how long will it take to heal the gut? I, I'm assuming every individual is different, but what's kind of like an average time frame? So typically I work with clients for a six month period. That's how I offer my packages. Within that six month period, we do the testing. So we get all the test results back. I craft a protocol. So a specific diet, supplement protocol, lifestyle changes. And typically that's for three months. So three months of a strict protocol, I like to call it, of what you want to be following. So in that time, it's a healing process. So you really want to work on reducing stress, taking time for yourself, focusing on high quality foods. Mm -hmm. You can still do social events and things like that, but they're going to be a little bit different. You know, you can't go binge drinking every weekend or things like that. You know, just being kind of calmer mm -hmm. and taking that time to heal, let your body heal. And then after those three months of a protocol, we kind of ease out of it, see how the person's doing, do a little bit of maintenance, and then see what to do next. A lot of people will feel amazing. So my work is done. Their gut is great. They're good to move on. Some people want another protocol. Some people want to run some blood work so I can do comprehensive blood chemistry. So looking at, well, maybe there's something up with their thyroid or maybe something with the cardiovascular health, whatever it might be. So mm -hmm. we look at those, those blood markers too, to see if there's anything we can recommend in addition to gut health, kind of looking on other systems of the body to support. Mm, okay. So, um, so you say usually your programs are six months. So someone's not going to be like, just give me the test and let me figure it out. <laughs> And I don't, you know, some people want that. They just want, just give me what to do and I'm good. I just find that that doesn't work. People need support. They need someone to ask questions. They need a cheerleader. So, mm -hmm. you know, working together for six months, it's, it's a commitment and an investment, but it's life-changing and you're kind of, you know, you're changing your identity in that time. It's amazing how people are, how much they've learned and how different they are and the habits they build. They're like, I can't even believe I wasn't doing this six months ago. Yeah. Okay. So what does, so what does the six months look like? Is it like weekly check-ins you're sending a meal plan or like, what does, what does it look like? Yeah. Great question. So we'll start off with initial diet changes. So before running any testing, I have people submit a food journal. So I kind of see what they're eating and just judging by either my dietary recommendations or maybe some of their symptoms, I recommend some diet tweaks. Then we wait for the test results to come in. We meet usually once a month or so. So we're checking in by email a lot, lots of check-in forms, but virtual meetings, and I do everything virtually by video, we do about once a month. So I'm always there for contact 24 seven if they need to shoot me an email or anything like that, I'm always available. And during that three month protocol, weekly check-ins. So we're making sure that everything's feeling good, a couple calls to make sure that there's no strange detox symptoms, which can happen when your body's killing off a lot of those overgrowths. So just supporting them making sure that we implement some lifestyle changes too. So not only are we working on diet, which is a really important piece of it, but things like stress management, how's your sleep, how's your exercise routine and little by little, just layering on baby steps. I don't want to throw everything at once yeah. and get, make it super overwhelming, but little by little. And that's where they build those habits over that six month time period. Mm -hmm. And then guess what meal plans. So I usually provide one initial meal plan and a bunch of recipes people always think they want meal plans. And I have found in the past that people really don't follow meal plans. It's so hard to, you have to be so regimented. Maybe one yeah. day you're not really hungry for dinner. Maybe the next day you have family visiting and then all your meal plans just kind of go out the window. So it becomes more stressful. So I like to give recipes and kind of, you know, give, don't give them the, fi the fish, teach them how to fish type of thing. So here, yeah. here are the things that you're looking for. Here are recipe sites I like. If you need any suggestions, I'm here. But it's very much a teaching process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you said, you know, teach a man the fish, you know, um, you know, instead of just handing them here, do this yeah. and they're going by, you know. Right. And then the six months say. are over. Yeah. And they don't know what to do anymore because they don't have a weekly meal plan. So and also like just that. figuring out what they like, you know, because even though you may give a meal plan, they may be like, I don't like chicken I don't, or, or this totally. one. I mean, they have to figure out, you know, what do they like and what makes them feel good, you know? And, um, and are you strict on like, oh, three meals a day and this type of stuff like that. Are you strict on that or are you, are you more intuitive? Like, oh, you know, do what your body's telling you. Mm -hmm. More intuitive. But if people's hunger signals are off, which often happens, especially with women, especially if you've been in the, in the dieting cycle. So I do like three meals a day, especially for the demographic I work with, which is just a lot of skin conditions. Fasting is stressful to the body. 
especially cycling women. So women who are a childbearing age, it's a lot to go 14, 16 hours without eating, without nutrients. And that can cause a stress response in the body, which can actually end up leading to something like acne. So I typically like breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and being consistent with your meal times. So your body and your brain know what time to expect food. So it's very like calming to the system. And then focusing on the macronutrient composition of the meal. So I'm not into calorie counting or anything like that, but I really want every meal to be balanced. So I want a good amount of protein, especially breakfast, because that helps you regulate blood sugar for the rest of the day. And so often you look at the breakfast options, what our food system has recommended to eat for breakfast, like pancakes and waffles and cereal. There's no protein in that. It's all carbs and sugar. So that's a horrible breakfast to start for blood sugar regulation and health. So you really want to focus on higher protein breakfast, whether that's something like meat, if you eat meat or eggs or yogurt, if you can tolerate it, a healthy smoothie, things like that. Um, and then every meal, just making sure that you have protein, healthy fats and some kind of vegetable fiber, which would be your carbohydrates. Okay. Okay. So um, you do gear towards the three meals a day, but at the end of the day, um, they have to also be intuitive. Exactly. And I so more so gear for those three meals for those cycling women. For example, if you're menopausal or if you're a man, typically you can get away with two meals a day or even one meal a day. Some people feel great doing that. But if you're childbearing age female, I would say three meals a day is typically a better option. Okay. 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 Um, I feel like we, we covered so much so quickly. Um, do Is there anything else you want to fill in towards like healing the guts and things we should know? I would say one place to start with, which is so basic, is just chewing your food and being calm when you're eating. So if you get digestive issues, like especially like in gassiness or bloating, it could just be that you're eating too fast and you're not in that rested state so your body can actually digest the food. So it could be a simple solution of just don't scroll on Instagram while you're, you're eating, don't watch TV, don't be at your computer working multitasking, mm -hmm. sit at your dining table, look out the window and slowly eat your food chewing well in a rested state. So that could be one thing to start with. If you're like, I don't want to spend any money or time on healing my gut. What can I do? That's easy. That could be one place to try. Okay. And oh, I meant to ask, um, do you do supplements? Like, are you keen on supplements? What type of supplements do you do offer? Mm -hmm. So it really depends on what we find in the stool test. So that's going to be your antimicrobial protocol. So I don't use antibiotics. I'm not a licensed practitioner. So we use antimicrobial. So there's strong herbs to eradicate. So that's going to be if there's something overgrown. So that's definitely a place where I do feel like supplements are necessary. It's just not really possible to heal the gut with diet alone. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's things that could help with digestion, like supplementing enzymes or hydrochloric acid to really help digest the food while you're in a healing process. I really like other supplements just for long-term health. For example, omega-3s, so like fish oil is a good one for a lot of people. If you're mm -hmm. deficient in vitamin D, that's something you want to look into. And overall, I think a multivitamin is a great choice. Just cover all your bases. Even if you're eating a healthy diet, there's still likely nutrients you might be low in. So just finding a high quality multivitamin as just your sort of insurance policy. Okay. And just uh, so like someone's like, okay, I'm going to order me a vitamin now from Amazon. Uh, what should they be looking for in a high quality vitamin? What makes a high quality vitamin? Great question. So first of all, Amazon's a tricky place to buy supplements. They've had a lot of issues with reports that what they say is in the bottle isn't in the bottle. So mm -hmm. if you can avoid buying from Amazon, I would recommend avoiding it. Even buying at pharmacies like a Walgreens or CVS, they're just really poor quality supplements. So the forms of the actual nutrient are going to be poor quality. So ideally, what you want to look for is buying from practitioner grade companies. So there's a certain website, something called Full Script, which sells practitioner grade supplements. And those are going to be ones that are approved by practitioners that are like naturopathic doctors, chiropractors, nutrition therapists like me. So really high quality forms of the vitamin and none of the toxic junk that goes into the other ingredients. Like if you look at a a, a bottle of, of some kind of supplement, oftentimes there's going to be like weird fillers, colorings that are in the other ingredients. And that's not necessary. That's just... They're, you're basically wasting your money on just filler stuff. Yeah, I know. And it's like everything's a chewable and then they're adding mm -hmm. all these flavors and totally. like, yeah, all the gummies. And it's like, wait, where's the vitamin? It's just candy. Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, so it's called Full Script, and is it like um F U L L S S C? I'm so tongue twisted. R I P T. Yeah, yeah. So if if you are interested, you can open an account under my name, and you get a ten percent discount on anything on that site. So oh, okay. that's an easy way to do it. Yeah, email me the details about that so we can um, put your name, you know, underneath it. Okay, okay, yeah. So, oh, so that's cool. So I've never heard the full script. So I, I, I look forward to go visiting their, um, their website. And you know, just like you said, it, you know, until we can maybe get to the place of saying, okay, am I ready for the six month commitment? You know, am I ready? Because it also is a mental thing. Like, am I ready to give up the fry, this and this and that, you know? So it's like, maybe I'll do it, you know, in the fall. Um, so to know that we can just start off with like a really good quality um vitamin is good to know and not to do Amazon. Cause I'm like, you know, we do Amazon for everything, but thank you for bringing that to our awareness as well too. That mm -hmm. yeah. Cause it's like, sometimes as I've a seller, you don't know what they are selling you. Um, yeah. <laughs> totally. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So was there anything else before we start to get to close out the show that you want to share with us? I don't think so. I think we covered a really great variety of things and good first things for people to do. And some main diet changes to make if you're, you know, if your gut is bothering you. So I, th I think you've got to ask some great questions. Thank you. So, oh, well, thank you for sharing so much amazing information. I think everything you said held, held so much value and I think we could all benefit from it and, you know, and hopefully we'll all start to say, let's, let's get on the program of healing the gut and make this <laughs> for the next six months so we can feel good for the rest of our lives. Totally. I hope so. Yeah. Um, so before I let you go, I would love for you to share with us, what does becoming unique mean to you? Oof, I would say it's finding what you're truly cut out to be doing and maybe listening to the signs, whether that's, you know, from the universe or however you want to see it. And I think mine was health and nutrition and just seeing that that path was the right one for me. And I listened and it was scary because I was an engineer with a master's degree and then just completely shifting and doing something completely different. People thought I was crazy. But I love it. And it's completely changed my life. And it's so rewarding. So I think, yeah, becoming unique is just really listening to finding what you're here for. Yeah, I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for showing up in the world as a healer. We appreciate you and have a beautiful day. <laughs>